Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you chose to come and join us for worship this morning. Uh, there are just a few quick announcements that I want to make real quick. First, I just want to remind everyone of our Club SBC Fall Fun Night, which is going to be this uh, this coming Wednesday. So it's a normal time, 5.45 to 7. Um, we're we're going to have a lot of fun things, so please, uh, please come out and join us for that. Um, an important reminder for that night, there will not be the adult prayer meeting or Bible study um, since we're having the uh, Club SBC Fall Fun Night, so just so you are aware of that. Um, we also still could use any candy, so if you have any candy you haven't dropped off that you purchased to uh, donate for that, uh, we would love to have that as well. Uh, one last uh, reminder for every, actually two, uh, one being the uh, Ridge Baptist Association uh, Fifth Sunday Hymn Sing. Uh, that's going to be next Sunday night um, at 6.30 p.m. There's still sign-up sheets. We still need um, help with just like some um, refreshments, sandwiches, cookies, things like that. We'll be having light refreshments afterwards, so please sign up for that. And then the last thing I have is um, the youth shoebox packing party. So um, I'm going to get the youth together, and we're going to go through all those shoeboxes that you guys turned in. Uh, just make sure that everything is good. There's nothing in there that doesn't need to be in there. Um, so that's going to be Saturday, November 5th from 6 to 8, and we'll have, um, we'll have dinner at that. So um, that's all the announcements that I have. Um, one last thing, Pastor Jeff is on vacation, um, so he's out of the office this week. So if you uh, need anything, please either contact me, contact the church office, or you can contact um, your family deacon. So that's all the announcements that we have. So now I just want to ask if everyone would please stand and take a few moments to greet one another. you please uh, stand and join me as we pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for this time where we can just come and gather as, as your people, um, Father, people that are united in our belief in, in you and in your son Jesus. And Father, we just pray that um, these next few moments and, and everything that is said and done from, from the worship through song to worship through us giving our tithes and offerings to the worship through preaching of the word, Father, we pray that everything will be focused on you. And God, that you would receive all the praise, all the honor, and the glory for everything. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Drink the rest as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Drink the rest as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not fail. Thank you. 
the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youth will become weak and tired. A young man will fall in exhaustion, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Man. All right. Everybody ought to be happy today. Has everybody been blessed by God today? I heard a song this morning and it said, I'm going to lift my hands in praise for the blessings that God is going to give to me. Verses, but we we already had. Please be seated. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, for scriptures, this morning I had a couple picked out, and I said, "Well, I, I'll mark them, and for which one I turn to, I'll read." But this is uh, coming from John, uh, the 16th, 16th chapter, John, verse thirty-three. I have told you these things so that in me that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And your Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that we have to come out to worship you. Open our hearts that we are receptive to the message, dear Lord. I just pray that you will watch over each and every one as we go in our lives each and every day. I just pray as we come for, or take these off this morning that you may use them to furnish your call. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much, choir. Uh, now is the time in our service where we will have our children's corner. So if you have any children that would like to come forward uh, for that, we will still have children's church. So right after the children's corner is over, um, you guys can head back um, for children's church with Miss Rebecca. She will be waiting at the door. So, all right. So, hope y'all are doing good this morning. I did have an object lesson, but my object lesson could not be here this morning. He was not feeling well. I was going to use Ender because Ender has started doing something, okay? Now, Ender loves to play with just about anything, but if you take something away from Ender that he's not supposed to have, like keys or a phone or something that he, he wants to play with it, but you take it, you know what he does? He screams. 
And so now, when he screams, you know what I have to do? I have to say, no, we're not screaming. And you know what he does? He looks at me and goes, and he screams more. <laughs> so I'll have to, you know, give him a toy that he can have. I say, hey, you can play with this. And so, and then he gets better. But you know, sometimes the hardest thing for me and for, for Miss Micah is when he screams like that, when we take something away, you know what the easy thing to do would be? To give it to him. I could give him the phone and play with it. But it's hard for me to discipline him. Even though he's so little and he doesn't understand, I still have to teach him, hey, when we take something, you can't scream. And it's hard. But did you know that mommies and daddies, they have to discipline you because they love you? Do you like it when your mommies and daddies discipline you? No, that's not fun. And, and you know what? Your mommies and daddies don't like doing it either. You may think they do, but they don't. But you know why they do it? It's because they love you. You know, there's a verse in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, that says that God disciplines those that he loves. So if God disciplines people that he loves, if your mommies and daddies discipline you, it's because they love you too. So that's what I want you to remember, okay? Next time you do something wrong and you want to get mad and your mom and dad have to get on to you, remember, God disciplines people because he loves them. So that means your mommies and daddies love you too, okay? So can I pray for you all and then you'll go back with Miss Rebecca? All right, let's pray. God, we just thank you for this day. And God, we just pray that you would help us to um, remember that even when there's times in our lives where we have to be disciplined, um, God, that we're disciplined because we are loved and that we would always remember that. And we thank you for loving us. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. All right, so I am, once again, very, very humbled and thankful for the opportunity just to um, stand before you all and just share God's word with you and um, just continue to be in prayer for Pastor Jeff as um, he and Miss Kelly, they're just getting some, some much needed rest. So um, just pray for them and, and just another reminder, if you need something, um, try to let them rest. So, you know, give me a call and we'll see if we can help you without bothering them. Um, but again, I'm just so thankful to be able to um, share this message this message that God has laid on my heart uh, this morning. So if you were with us last week, um, we talked about the church, and we, we kind of looked at the question, what is the church? And, and we were um, trying to answer that question. And so uh, this morning, we're going to continue on with looking at that, that topic of, of what is the church. So, so last Sunday, we looked at the very first time in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where Jesus used the word that we translate church, ecclesia. Um, th this word ecclesia means a called out assembly. And so uh, we looked at in Matthew chapter 16, the first time that Jesus used this word. And last week we saw that the church is really just, it's an assembly of people who are united in, in their belief that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the son of God, and then they are called out by the power of the Holy Spirit to live the mission of Jesus while we're on this earth. And we looked at that through Matthew chapter 16 of what is the church. And in all of the Gospels, there was only two times that Jesus used the word church. The first time, like I said, was in Matthew chapter 16 that we looked at last week. And today we're going to be looking at the second time, the last time, that Jesus used the word church. Again, that word is ecclesia. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. And so today, uh, th this message, I titled it The Family of God. You may have noticed we sang a different song earlier, um, and, and that was not by accident. Um, so as you guys are turning to in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, um, we're going to specifically be looking at verses 15 through 20. And, and, and as you guys are doing that, I want to tell you guys a story that comes to my mind when I hear the word family, since we are talking about the family of God this morning. Um, I want to tell you a story that comes to my mind. So some of you guys may have heard this story. Um, I know most of our youth definitely have, unless you have just recently started um, coming and hanging out with us. Um, but most of you may have heard the story a little bit. But when I was in my 
20s. I was 20, 21. Um, I, I joined the military at 20. And in my life, I was very blessed. I, I was never uh, confronted with alcohol or anything like that. When I was um, in high school, that was something I never struggled with. But, but when I was 20, I joined the military. Um, that was something that was very prevalent in that culture. And so it was something that I was exposed to. And so uh, I was 21. I moved to Korea. Um, my first duty station, first time ever on a plane, first time ever away from home like that. And so I, I really needed, wanted, needed a friend group. And so I kind of gravitated towards a group of guys there and um, what they did every night, not just on the weekends, but every night was they would go out and they would drink. And so for me to kind of feel a part of that, to, to have that friend group, I started to do that with them. So I, I would go out. It started just, you know, Friday night, Saturday night. I would go out with them. I, I would, you know, hang out with them. I would drink with them. And then it kind of turned into what they did. I, it was every night. I would get off work. I would go hang out with them. It would be an, like an everyday thing. Uh, we, we would hang out. We would drink. And we would we'd wake up, feel horrible, but go throughout the day again. That, that's just what we did. And so about six or seven months, me being in Korea, I got to go home and take uh, take leave. And so I got to come home. Um, it just so happened that my leave fell right along the time that my mom had a stroke. It was a very, very serious stroke. And uh, I was going to go home early, but she wanted me to wait because we had planned my leave to fall around a trip to the beach. And so she was determined that in the two weeks, if she had a stroke, and then two weeks later was when I was supposed to come home. She was determined, no, I'm going to be well enough to go to the beach. And by God's grace, she was. She was able to, to get around, and she went to the beach. And so I flew home, and I was there, and a, a couple of my, my friends from back home were, were there with us. And um, another thing that came with me from Korea was this habit that I picked up of I went out and I drank. And my dad had made it very clear when I was living in the house, you know, that wasn't something that we did, but, you know, I came back and, and the, the one night that this actually happened, I, I, I didn't really go out and drink, but for whatever reason, Friday night, I wanted to. And so I did, and, and those two buddies that were with me, we, we all did, and um, it, it ended up where I kind of, I passed out, um, I think it was on like a back of a golf cart or something. And so uh, eventually I got back home, but my dad was out looking for me. It was like 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, I wasn't home. And so I ended up getting back home. My dad was not there. My mom was. She was kind of waiting at the door for me, and, and I didn't want to hear anything she had to say, so I kind of just moved her, shoved her out of the way, and I went and passed out. And um, if you know me and you've heard me tell the story, that, that, is, that was one of the moments when a few days later, you know, I realized what I had done. That was really a defining moment in me understanding the dangers of alcohol. Um, because I would never want to put my hands on my mother in any type of way. And even, you know, in that moment, just shoving her out of the way, that was something I would never have done. But um, that next morning, getting back to family, right, when I think of family, um, it was probably 10 in the morning, you know, so I got a couple hours of sleep. But I was woken up by my dad. Now, you just think if you were in that situation, your 21-year-old son just came home, shoved your wife who just had a stroke out of the way, how you would want to react in that moment. But what my dad did, he came in and he had a plate of grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, so he, my dad, he, he loves to cook, but he thinks that he is this, you know, super, super chef or something. So he, he, even a grilled cheese sandwich, he would like cut it and plate it. And he had like pickles, like arranged, like some fancy five-star restaurant, right? And he came in there with that, right? So, and I know for a fact, like we didn't have pickles. So he had to go and get that. He made that. I, I love grilled cheese, by the way. I, don't, I love pickles with it. I don't know why. So he made that for me. And he had aspirin on the side of the plate and some water. And he came in, he woke me up, he said, Brandon, I want you to take this, and so I, I took the aspirin, of course, I, ha I had a headache, um, it was horrible, and then he proceeded to talk to me, 
He gave me that, told me he wanted me to eat that, and he said, Brandon, I, I want you to know that I love you, but I'm disappointed in you, and I expect better from you. And that was all that he said. And then we continued out the rest of that day. We went and we visited uh, my aunt who lived at the beach. We went and did everything that we would normally do. Not another word was said about that incident. Until a couple of days later, he said, Brandon, now that you're better, we need to have another talk. And this is part of the story where most of you may not know. Um, but he made me go and apologize to the parents of those friends that I bought alcohol for and apologize to them for how I acted and apologize to my mom. What he made me do is, is he made me repent. And he made me seek forgiveness. And that has been a moment in my life where I, I truly saw what a family is. You may think that's a weird thing to say, but for me, I, I learned in that moment that a family is an intimate relationship with people where not only do you feel love, but you also are made better. And even in those moments where you do mess up, because you have that close relationship with them, you can experience love, even like we said with the children, through that discipline, through that correction so I tell you all that I tell you that story because I, I believe that that story has a lot of tie-ins to our text this morning um, because the, the text we're going to look at can be a very difficult one it can be a hard one for people to receive it can be a hard one for us to um, understand and it can be a very hard one for us to even live out um, but I think that Jesus is trying to teach us from this text a lot about what his church should be like. And so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. So I would ask if, if you're able, could you please stand um, as we read the word of God together. So I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Father, we pray that this morning we would be open and receptive to hear what you would have to say to us this morning. And Father, that if you do speak to us, in whatever way you speak to us this morning, Father, we pray that we would listen. God, I pray that however you speak to me this morning, Father, I pray that whatever you tell me to do, that I would have the boldness to, to do it. Father, I pray that you would be our teacher, you would be our preacher, that we'd hear directly from heaven this morning. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, so, as we read, um, this passage is about church discipline. That is a way I can sum, sum that up. Church discipline, or another way, the way that I like to refer to it, more so than church discipline, because uh, I think church discipline can kind of miss the mark a little bit on what this passage is really saying. It's about confronting sin. Confronting sin in the church. And, and this can be a very difficult passage because I know we, we would all agree we are all sinners. We all 
are sinners. We have all fallen short. The Bible teaches us that. And so it can be hard to address sin when I think what most of us want to do is we look inward too. So we may see a sin and we may say, hey, I really should address that, but well, I used to do that. I, 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 I still do this. It, it can be really hard. Um, this passage can be really hard to, to act out. But regardless, Jesus speaks. And so we need to, to listen and hear what he has to say. So first, I think we really need to look at what Jesus is actually commanding his disciples to do. So in, in verse 15, um, we, we know that he is talking to his disciples. He's talking to this group of 12, um, this group of 12 men that, that had many different professions. You know, they were fishermen, they were tax collectors, they were religious zealots. Various different backgrounds, wealthy, poor, all a group of men that were called away from whatever their profession was to follow Jesus as he went out on his mission. And basically for over a year at at this point, at least over a year, they've been together every day. Every day they're together. Every day they are, are united and following Jesus. They're going out. Um, following Jesus on his mission. They are a group, they're an assembly. A called by Jesus, assembly going out with Jesus on mission. That sounds a lot like a church. Anyway, um, but they're a group and they're together every day. And Jesus directly addresses them and he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Jesus is addressing, confronting one-on-one someone that has sinned. Now, in the New King James Version, it says sins against you. There are other translations that word it, if your brother sins. So you can look at it in one of two ways. If you see a brother or sister that is a part of your fellowship that sins, that commits any kind of sin, any kind of transgression against God, that this is what Jesus is talking about, or if you have a brother or sister that sins directly against you. I think both of these are applicable and both of these are are right in how Jesus addresses what we should be doing. So whether it is someone that directly sins against you or you see someone that is a part of your fellowship that is just blatantly sinning and not being repentant, just continuing in on the sin, this is how you address them. And the first way is you. You address them alone. I know that it's not, okay, let me take it to Facebook. Let me go to Instagram or Twitter. It's you address them one-on-one, right? And I think that could be a very uh, difficult thing, intimidating thing to do too, because it really checks your motives, right? If someone sins against you, and, and you go to address that with them one-on-one, if you're angry, what's that going to turn into? It's going to turn into fight, right? But that's not what Jesus is talking about. It, it says, verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. What's the motive supposed to be in addressing this person who sinned against you to gain them back. It's not, hey, I, I want to make you feel bad about what you did. It's not, I want to make sure you know what you did. No, it's about gaining them back. It's about restoring that. So something was broken. If they've sinned against you, something was broken. So your motive in confronting them is to restore that. So this gets really hard, not just you having to go and talk to them on your own, but you have to go and talk to them just you and your motive be restoring the relationship. Not getting your feelings out, not making sure that all your anger and all your rage is being you know, put out towards them so they know how mad you are. No, you're there to restore. You're there so you might gain your brother back. So that makes this very, very difficult. 
It really checks our motives. This isn't about revenge. This isn't about humiliation. This is about restoring. You, you gotta hear the heart of what Jesus is saying here. All right, it, it's about, hey, your brother is doing something wrong. You wanna try to bring them back. I, I instantly think about my dad, right? I clearly sinned against him and I just, in general, was in sin. So however you want to, want to translate that, I, I, I fit into both. And so my dad could have come in anger. It may, may be justified anger. But I believe my dad demonstrated this principle that he came, it was just me and him, and the whole point behind our conversation was he wanted me to be better. He wanted to restore what I had broken between him, between him and, between me and my mom, and between me and the Lord. That was his motive. So that's the first thing I think we have to see here is Jesus is commanding his disciples. Someone does something one-on-one. Well, what if that doesn't work? What if, what if you go and talk to somebody and you're like, hey, look, I, I saw you at I saw you at the Walmart the other day, and I saw how, how you yelled at that lady in front of you that was taking too long to get her money out of her bag. And I just felt like the Lord was telling me, hey, when you did that, you, you ran out of anger, and that was wrong. And I just felt like I needed to tell you. If they say, hey, you're right, you're absolutely right, I went home and had to, to, to confess that to the Lord and, and pray and repent of my anger, then praise God, you've gained your brother. But what happens if they say, you don't tell me what to do. Hey, you don't know. Like, I had been waiting for 10 minutes, and then you came up. Like, you don't know. They weren't, weren't respective. What, what do you do? Like, they, they, they didn't receive you trying to correct them, show them their sin. Well, Jesus then says, we see in verse 16, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So now Jesus is kind of widening the net a little bit. All right, include, you know, one or two more people. Go and talk to them again and, and, you know, address this sin. And again, this isn't a, okay, now I got my boys with me. You're going to see what you did wrong. It's a, you you want to restore your brother, right? You're you're, you're trying to, to get them to see, hey, you re- what you did, re- it really was wrong. You know, we're, we're here, we, we want to talk to you about it. And this principle, it's taken out of Deuteronomy. So, so in Deuteronomy chapter 17 and in chapter 19, God kind of gives the Israelites a way to handle um, when someone does something wrong. And so uh, in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, it says, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity, or any sin that he commits, but by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. So this is even an Old Testament practice that the disciples would have understood. Hey, you know, it's always better if you have more people with you. So one-on-one didn't work. Let's bring more people together. Now, where this kind of changes from where Deuteronomy, if you did something wrong, if you sinned, in Deuteronomy, not only were you punished by being separated from God, but you could be killed. You, you could be killed because of your, your, your sin. These two or three people could gather together, condemn you for your sin, and then they could also punish you. And that punishment could be death. But what Jesus is saying here is, is not death. He's saying, no, no, we, we want to restore. We're trying to build this relationship back. We're trying to bring this brother or sister back. So we see in 17, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So the final option, I guess the the nuclear option, all right, nothing else works. What are we going to do? This person is not wanting to listen. They're still doing this thing. They're, they're, they're not wanting to say that they're sorry. They're not wanting to seek repentance. What do we do? And then we see Jesus use, for the second time, ecclesia. Take it to the church. Take it to the called out assembly. Now, 
when he was telling the disciples that, I don't think, I don't think what ran through their mind was taking a person before a group of 150, 160 people and saying, hey, this is what they did. They need to repent. I, I don't think that's what they thought. Because, what, let's get their context. What, what was their context? What was their group? Their group of, their, their 12, their assembly, that they were living life together. They were called out. They were together on that mission. They were living together. I don't think they would have instantly jumped to, you know, us, what we have going on right here. Because, you know, I think if, let's just say, random person on pew three over here has a problem with a person on, you know, row 25, and then we get random people from, you know, pew 50 to go and talk to them, like, they're not going to care, right? But who, who are you again? You know, I know I've seen you. Who are you? You're not going to know, you know? And then if they, they come up here and, I, and they have no idea who most of y'all are, maybe they recognize a few people from their Sunday school class, are they going to be very receptive to, hey, if you don't repent of this, you know, you, you were yelling in Walmart, that's not good. Like, you have to repent of your anger. And they're still in front of everybody saying, well, who are y'all? I don't care about y'all. I'll do what I want in Walmart. And they walk out. They're not going to be upset. They're probably going to find another church just to go to next week, and everything will be fine. What I think makes this make sense, how this works, and, and why I think this is Jesus teaching us something even greater than just how to confront sin, is I think this final option of taking it to the church only works when that person knows intimately that church. When that person has a relationship with each person in that church and that person knows, hey, am I going to choose my right to be angry in Walmart over these people that I know love me? Because that's, that's what the nuclear option is. You presenting it in such a way as like, hey, we love you. We were here for you through this, through this, through this. And we don't want you to continue down this path of letting anger control you. Are you going to choose that over us? That's what this is. This is not, okay, you, you've been tried and found convicted. You're standing before the church and we're going to excommunicate you. I don't think that's what Jesus is really teaching here. I think he's teaching about a family that is trying to hold someone accountable. Now, what happens if they're still not receptive? It says, hey, if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, there is something that is broken there, right? They're no longer a part of the family. But how do you treat a heathen and tax collector? How did Jesus t treat the heathen and tax collector? He still showed love. He didn't, hey, you can't come in the door. But were the heathens and tax collectors a part of the twelve? No. When they repented, yes. So what Jesus is saying is, hey, you may have to not let that person be involved intimately with you guys right now. You're going to have to exclude them from the mission, from that intimate relationship that y'all have. But still the hope is that when they're out doing whatever they're doing, look at the prodigal son. He realized what he was missing from that intimate relationship with his father, and he came back. That is the goal through all this, is that you have this family, this intimate family, that when someone sins, when someone is disobeying the Lord, that you can go and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, you know I love you. I saw you do this. This is wrong. Or you can go with a group of two or three other people and say, hey, you know we love you and you know that you're doing this, you know this is wrong. And then you could bring them before your whole group, this group that is so intimately involved together. And you say, hey, we love you. And this is, you know this is wrong. This is what God's word says. This is wrong. We love you. And the whole purpose is to restore. And, and I think through this, and you may be thinking, Brandon, what does this have to do with the family of God? I think what Jesus is teaching us is that the family of God needs to be an intimate family. We talked last week how God's church 
is a missional force to go out and carry out his mission on the earth, but I also think his church is an intimate family. It's an intimate family, an intimate group of people that know each other, that care about each other, that love each other. Not a group of random strangers that you see once a week. Now, please don't hear me that I'm saying there's anything wrong with what we're doing. That's not what I'm saying. But if you don't know the other people that are in this congregation, you're missing out on what Jesus is saying the church is. Because what I think he is implying here, when he says, take it to the church, he's talking about a family. He's talking about a family. What is the church? It's a family. It's not just a gathering of people that don't know each other, but it's a family. And this isn't the the only time that Jesus has talked about the family in reference to his kingdom and to his church. In, In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus was saying, hey, like a family, like you love your mother, like you love your your father, like you love your siblings, you need to love me more. My kingdom is a family. Matthew chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, it says, he stretched out his hands towards his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. See, Jesus, he spoke in a way regarding his disciples, regarding his church, like it was a family. He was taking what God established in creating the family, and he was building off of that to make something even greater when it came to his church. Think about your family. Think about how close you are with your family. Think about when something happens. Think about when someone passes away. What do you do? You're together. What do we do when someone in the family has something that they're struggling with and they just can't break it? We may not take it to the church. We may call it like an intervention or something, right? You know, you've heard that. That's like the modern day time for like, hey, this is, you got to stop. This is wrong. But you're there for each other. That's what God wants his church to be, a family. A family that we can come together with our problems, with our mistakes, not just the good times. I'm so thankful that my dad is not just my dad when I'm not drinking. That he wasn't just my dad when now that I'm the youth pastor, now that that I have my own family, that I'm not doing all the things that I used to do. I, I'm glad that he was still my dad even when I was in those messes. Because family is not just in the good, but it's in the bad. And that's the same thing for the church. Because we're a family. We are supposed to be an intimate family, but also an accountable family. Like we talked about with the children, no parent would be a good parent if they did not hold their kids accountable and teach them and discipline them. And as a church family, we we would be just as useless if we did not hold each other accountable. But I'll tell you right now, I I know there, there are several of you in here, if I just randomly come up to you and said, hey, I saw you at Walmart the other day and you were yelling at somebody and you don't need to do that, you would get mad at me for saying that. Because who am I to tell you that? You, you know me. I may know you. But there's a lot of you in here I don't have that intimate relationship with. Now, if it was one of the youth, if it was one of my volunteers, if it was Britain, you know, maybe Miss Katie, like we, we have that closer relationship because we, we do more things together, I think I could. But for some of you, maybe, maybe it would be a Sunday school teacher. That would be the person that would come up to you and say, hey, you know, maybe... You know, Mr. Rusty would come up to someone that was in his Sunday school class, maybe not even teaching. He's like, hey, they're in my class. I saw this. Hey, that would be okay. 
Because what does that mean? He had a relationship with them. So accountability comes from intimacy. Like you, you can't hold someone accountable if you don't have a close, intimate relationship with them. That's why Jesus is saying, hey, my, my church, the family of God, is an intimate family first. That is also an accountable one. See, I find it interesting, after he teaches this, after he tells them the steps, right? In verse 18, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm, I'm giving you the right to, to bind things, to say, hey, this, this is not good. This is not allowed. Or you can loose things. Hey, th- this, this is what we are allowing. This is what we are letting free, letting go. He gave his disciples, he gave the church the ability to bind and loose things, to say, hey, yelling at someone in the Walmart line because they're not going fast enough, we're binding that. That is not okay. Helping the lady carry her stuff out, that is showing compassion. You leaving your buggy to go and help her, that, that is okay. We're loosening that. That is allowed. That is good. Jesus gives his church the ability to hold each other accountable. He tells them, hey, whatever you bind, whatever you loose, that, that, that is what is allowed. He calls us to hold each other accountable. When I read this, he's not saying, hey, just take, you know, just do whatever. No, we, we're supposed to bind and loosen things. We're supposed to say, hey, you do not need to act like that. We're called to hold each other accountable. So do you have that family? Do you have that intimate family that you are involved with that you allow them to, to hold you accountable in your life? Maybe you come and you're a part of our church, but you don't know anybody. I would encourage you to maybe join a Sunday school class. Maybe come on Wednesday night for the, the Bible study. You know, get, get to know people because you need that family. That's what God's church is. It's the family of God, an intimate family that holds each other accountable, but also one that is committed to each other. And we all need that. You know, I think back to uh, that story I told you at the beginning with, with my dad. And... It wasn't this particular time, but this was something that, you know, I, I struggled with for, for a while, and, and he was very clear that, hey, this is not something that I'm going to allow in, in my house. And for the longest time, I really did not like him saying that. Like, I, I just didn't understand it. You know, if you love me, like, why, why would you? I don't get it. But now, looking back, I can see that through his close relationship with me, he was holding me accountable, but what he was doing, he was making me commit to something. Either I was going to commit to not be a part of the family because I wanted to hold on to this alcohol, or I was going to commit to my family that loved me, was there for me, supported me, encouraged me. He was making me commit to something. And so when I read Matthew chapter 18 and these verses on how to confront sin, I used to think, this is so judgmental. This is, why why would Jesus want you to like to confront people and say, hey, stop doing this. But now I see because I put myself in the other person's shoes, not the, not the person that was confronting the sin, but I put myself in the person that was confronted. It's done out of love. It's built off of a close relationship. I mean, I could just imagine these disciples, these 12 disciples, getting it. Like, hey, yeah, that makes sense. Like, hey, if, if Peter goes off and, you know, punches Thomas in the mouth... You know, Thomas and like, hey, Peter, that hurt, first of all, and why, why would you get so angry? You shouldn't do that. 
And if he doesn't listen, be like, well, Thomas, you deserve that. He would go get James and John. Be like, all right, let's talk about this. Like, Peter, Jesus was teaching us. He, he said, turn the other cheek. That we're supposed to, to love our enemies. And if Thomas did something, that, that's not how you respond. And, and then I think they could see getting everyone together. Be like, Peter, look, you, you know that was wrong. And one of those steps, I think they could see it very clearly. Hey, Peter's going to be like, you're right. Y'all love me. I messed up. And that relationship was going to stay together. That, that's how I read this. That intimate family. So, so here, here's my challenge for, for you all this morning. When you think of church, when you say, I'm going to church, right? And we won't get into that statement and <laughs> that, if that's accurate or not yet. But when you say, hey, I'm going to go to church, are you thinking about just a group of people where you're just going to sing and you may know half of them, you may know a few of them? Or you think about, hey, this is my family. Now, for some of us this morning, there might be people we need to get to know. There might be people that we need to intentionally try to meet and foster that relationship. Because what is God's church? It's a family. And family knows each other loves each other, holds each other accountable. So there, for some of us, we may have some uh, shaking hands and maybe some lunches to have. Maybe we need to get to know each other. But maybe you're here this morning, maybe you're not a part of the family. Maybe there's, there's never been a time where you have confessed your sin and you, you have believed on Jesus and you've become a part of his family. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. See, if you believe and trust in Jesus, you are his child. You're a part of his family. You're a part of this family of God. So first first thing this morning, if... If you've never accepted Jesus, this could be the time where you turn to him. You repent of your sin. You become a part of this family. The altar is going to be open. I'll be down here. If you know you're not one of his children, you're not a part of this family at all, today could be the day where you finally make that choice to turn from your sin and, and follow Christ. Maybe you've done that, though. Maybe you have followed Jesus, but Maybe all church is to you is just a gathering that you go to once a week. Maybe you need to take full advantage of that family that you are now a part of. Maybe you need to meet with people. Maybe, maybe you need a Sunday school class. Maybe you need a small group. Maybe you just need to, to meet with people and, and have, have friends that are a part of, of this church that you can have that relationship with you. Maybe this morning, maybe you know that there's sin in your life that people have tried to confront you about. People that love you, that have that intimate, close relationship with you, and they've tried to talk to you about it. Maybe you need to let that go. Maybe you need to go back and talk to that person and say, hey, I know I got angry, angry with you for confronting me on this, but I know you were just loving me. Or maybe... Maybe there is someone you need to in love confront. Whatever it is you need to do this morning, the altar is open. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for this day. and We thank you for your word. We, we thank you that your word will never return void. And, and Father, we pray that in this moment, wherever we find ourselves, when we think about the family of God, when we think about your church, Father, maybe we're not a part of your family. I pray that today might be the day of salvation for, for that one that is lost and far from you. Father, may, maybe we are your child, but maybe we've never taken advantage of the family. Maybe we need to, to be a part. Maybe we need to be active in, in seeking those intimate relationships with other people who believe like we believe. 
Father, maybe we need those people in our lives to hold us accountable, to build us up, to make us better. Speak to us now and give us the strength to, to do as you command us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you please stand? Again, I am so thankful that you chose to join us for worship this morning, and uh, my prayer for you is that you would have just an amazing week, um, that you would let the, the Lord go with you and the Holy Spirit guide you as you go throughout your everyday lives um, today and the rest of this week. And uh, just know that we love you, and we are glad that you chose to join our family this morning. We hope to see you back soon. Uh, let me pray for us. God, we just thank you so much, God, that you have given us a family to be a part of. God, I, I know I wouldn't trade my earthly family for anything. But God, I'm so grateful for the spiritual family that you've given me as well. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone that hasn't experienced what it's truly like to have that, God, they, they, they would look for it, that they would seek to find it. Be with us now as we leave this place. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs>